So bismillahirrahmanirrahim ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasulil karim amma ba'd so thank you for joining me again and um so today we're going to inshallah continue to talk about uh, Quran and science and uh, uh subhanallah last uh, time we talked it was really beautiful and uh so i wanted to ask you about um that book that you mentioned, the seven uh, pillars of wisdom. Yes, uh, that was written by Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, T. T. E. Lawrence. Very interesting book. Yeah, that's very interesting. I downloaded it to read it. I haven't read it yet, but uh, you mentioned that, so I thought, okay, I'll I'll uh, take a look yeah. at. It. Yeah, Lawrence. I mean, at one point, he admits that that he 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 felt he was being used. By the you know he was he was British intelligence, yeah. but but of course I think he really wanted or he thought th that that you know supporting the Sharif of Mecca as as the and and as well as King Faisal as the center of um, an Arab independence movement could, could also be you could could both be in support of the Allied war effort against. Uh, you know Germany and the Ottoman Empire, and at the same time, you know, be a real independence movement uh, for the Arabs, and that turned out not to be the case, you know, because it was, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the the British won, and they, you know, they dominated the uh, the Near East, and the, and they, with with the you know the Balfour Declaration and the Sykes Picot Treaty, they sliced up. The Middle East in, com in a completely artificial way, making nations so-called out of it, which is has created problems ever since because it was basically a tribal society, and they they tried to make it a series of nation states, which it might have evolved into on its own if it had been left alone. Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of the worst things that colonialism did in the world, and and Lawrence finally realized that he had been used. Or he'd let himself be used, whatever you want to say, for an outcome which which was very destructive. So, so. Subhanallah, and he was mysteriously killed. I guess. Uh, well, who knows? <coughs> I mean, possibly, or maybe he just died in an auto, a motorcycle accident. Uh -huh. We don't know. Yeah. yeah. So. All right, Bismillah. So, Quran and science. Um, so, last time I was talking about that the Quran, uh, you know, points to these signs, right? That kind of like validate uh, other epistemologies. Like, for example, the Quran will validate some aspects of the people of the book, meaning some things that are in their book. Yeah. The Quran will validate what is in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in terms of what Allah has created. And in fact, Quran almost demands that you look outside even the book to recognize that this is there's a synchronicity between the book and the creation. So, yes, there is, exactly. You know that there's, um, you know, to 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 the degree in in a way the Quran is 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 a is a book that 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 is that is or has become a world and. Uh, the other side of that is is to see the universe as a world that is in a certain sense a book. It is composed of of uh, the signs of Allah. It is it is as as if written by Him or is you know by the sublime pen on the guarded tablet. And um, you know, as we said last time, if, if if you look at the essence of of material reality as information, which is what the you know cutting edge physics physics is getting toward then you you know you have to say well in, in, in all the information we know was uh was composed by conscious beings ourselves for example so who composed the universe you know the, the, this question becomes paramount you know so the, the quran um you know we have to understand that 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 the the the, the essence of science is an appreciation, not just an aesthetic or emotional appreciation, but an actually a, uh, an appreciation of the actual qualities and processes of nature. 
Mm -hmm. you know, you look, looking at nature, learning from the natural world is the origin of science and the essence of science. You know, mm -hmm. but as, as we said last time, science gets so far beyond the natural world, creating, you know, a, a pseudo natural world of its own, a metaverse or whatever you want to call it, that we forget that simple fact. You know? Yeah, so. yeah. Um, I think it's called seismology, or uh, uh, you know, the the science of studying signs. Uh, oh, semiotics. Semiotics. Yeah. Well, I find even the word the Quran uses signs. Just the word. I mean, the word is just amazing to me because that's how the brain works. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that. Everything is pointing to something other than itself. Uh, it's like yes. Allah is saying, don't you see all this is pointing to something else? And Allah uses the word sign for it, or ayat, signs for it. Right. And I mean, you would really have to know the human being quite deeply uh, from the perspective of the timing of when the Quran was revealed. To even come close to something like that. Because that's how, I mean, like, you know, in philosophy we study, for example, I know this is, I call this a key because of its function as a key. But mm -hmm. but I would, if I was just artificial intelligence, my first thought would be this is just metal, right? It's not like the, like this is, it's it's what it's pointing to, what it does. And so it's... You know, yeah, I, it's all utilitarian. And artificial intelligence, you know, will tend to be pretty literalistic, will not have a symbolic consciousness, you know. And, um, you know, I, the, in the English language used to have much more symbolic consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I mean, you, you, look at, you look at the English of the, the Elizabethans, like Shakespeare and John Donne, and, and, and from our standpoint, you know, poet John Donne, from our standpoint, we look at those writers and we say, well, they must have been initiates in, in, into uh, occult secret societies that studied symbols, because look at all this symbolism. Well, the, the symbolism was just more in the language and more in people's everyday consciousness, you know, that uh, through partly through scripture and, and Bible, partly through folklore, you know, and, and a number of things. It was just people saw things more symbolically. And, and to do that, you do see that, I mean, you know, for, for for example, in the realm of romantic love, it used to be that, that that a man, you know, would it would be not strange for a man to see, you know, the the woman that he loved loves his beloved as a symbol of wisdom, a symbol of of or a symbol of destiny. You know, she is my destiny, or you know, she is an image of truth. To me, you know, which which is. Um, you know, you, you, you can find that uh, s certainly in Islam, you know, and, 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 and uh, in a certain sense in, in Quran. Oh, yeah, I mean, it, it's in Rumi. Rumi talks about, you know, brides or, or, or women as, as, as symbols or, or, or apparitions of truths. And, and this was sort of uh, not strange to people, even when I was growing up, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, it's strange because we we have we have eliminated symbolic consciousness. R Rene Guénon says um, the effect is the symbol of the cause, and you know that encapsulates so much of this. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you want to what look at what actually causes things, look at, at what those things symbolize. Mm -hmm. But we're living now sort of in a in a one layer universe where where there there are only material processes and and utilitarian concerns mm. and so the whole symbolic level of now on the other hand physics is, is is almost making it necessary for us to bring back a symbolic level of understanding by by uh seeing that the essence of everything on, on the deepest level we can perceive is information yet you know it's very hard for modern physics to suddenly see oh and that's what uh you know the human that's the way the human race has always looked at things and then that's the way shakespeare looked at things that 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 connection is is very hard for physicists to make so they try to reinvent the wheel you know and 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 not not see the um 
the similarities between the way they're being forced to look at reality and the way the traditional scriptures, for example, have always looked at reality. Very hard for them to do that. Mm. So, but I, I wish they would, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, so what has happened is as we move from Newtonian physics to relativity, relativity gave people of a religious bent, like a, a breath of fresh air almost. Well, in, in, in one way, it gave the breath and one, another way it took it away because it, it, it makes, in another, another way, it makes everything subjective. You know, every, I mean, th th there's a certain, yeah, it's relative. this is very metaphysical if you want to make sense of this, because like, you know, every, every point of view is, is just as good as every other point of view, because, mm. you know, uh, th 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 there is no center to space, no center to time, you know, uh, if, if, if you know, I, I at this position traveling at this rate of speed will, the universe will appear in a certain way. Someone else under, you know, traveling at a different rate of speed, you know, the universe will appear differently. So, so in a certain sense, it makes everything subjective or it has, is in danger of doing that, you know, mm. but, but there, there is no, it, 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 Einsteinian uh, relativity and quantum physics, uh, which Einstein couldn't deal with. He didn't like quantum physics he said but god does not play dice with the universe you, know, yeah, you can't right. just reduce everything to probabilities well <laughs> uh, but but yet in a larger sense those two come together to enforce a um you know a, a subjectivist view of things because you know uh, uh in the newtonian world you know space was absolute it was really there and and it, it had it had dimension and, and it, it it wasn't it wasn't warped but by gravity, and and it was uniform and time was uniform, and so you could you know really, you know you you had at least that much of a framework that is beyond subjective impressions or or subjective viewpoints, which mm. and, a, and, a, and an impression and a viewpoint are not are not quite the same thing, but you know, uh, you, you you so so. Uh, this could continue to suggest the reality of God, you know, mm. because something objective that's real. Right. Is the the universe is working on fixed laws. So it's yeah. like laws of and God. We, yes. still, we still say that, except we're, we're getting close to saying, well, why do we have to be you know, limited to this idea of fixed, you know, laws of the universe? Maybe the laws of the universe change over time or in, in, in uh, you know, alternate universes or such. So, so, um, so in, in, but in some ways, uh, yeah, uh, re relativity. See, um, let me see. What is the hadith? Uh, I guess I think it's hadith Qudsi, and Allah is saying, "I am as my servant sees me." Mm, I am uh, as my servant sees me, or thinks I am. Yeah, inna kama dhanna abdi anni. Yeah. So, so th 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 this is this is is. Uh, a, a very profound and and difficult thing to uh, to wrap your head around because if Allah is is just as we see him, then we've created him. He's not our creator. Hmm. He's some notion of ours, and any notion we come up with and call the absolute, well, that's going to be just as true as every other notion. Hmm. And that's nihilism. You know, mm. so but what's mysterious is is that Allah is 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 so absolute and 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 so so filled with uh, to overflowing with with the existence and the creation and the support of all things that any perspective you have on Him it is objectively true. It's not just a subjective notion of yours. If you see him in a certain way, he fills that conception of yours from his store of reality, fills it to overflowing and says, yes, I am indeed that because mm. I am real and I'm beyond you. And I, 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 I confirm that I am indeed that. Mm. But if you see him another way, he confirms that as well. You know, and this, this is, is one way of talking about the names of God, the different yeah. names of God. And also, or, that or if somebody's angry with God versus somebody is uh accepting the yeah. of Allah or happy with God or thankful yeah. to God. Or, 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 
or, or someone who's resigned to, to Allah's actions, you know, what are you going to do? He's more powerful than us and others. That, that that see that that you know consider him al Rahman the all merciful and and see that whatever he does ha has a profound good in it you know that is beyond what we may understand but has that kind of faith so so the names are ranged in ranks the mm -hmm. higher you know the higher names like al Rahman you know if if you can see God as the all merciful you have a profound view of all existence mm -hmm. you know whereas if you see God as something like you know the the uh, the abaser or the postponer or or one of those smaller names, which are just just as valid, but they're not as large. You know, this is all I see is you know you know God is the postponer because I keep wanting this to happen and He keeps saying not yet, and that's all you see, and that's mm -hmm. true. It's not untrue because God fills every your every conception of Him with His reality, mm -hmm. but it's not a very large conception. And we want to, to rise to higher names, you know, and, and to, to the names of the essence, like al haq or al Kudus, you know, mm -hmm. the, the holy, the, 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 the true, the, the truth, the holy, and things like that. Then, then we're seeing more deeply into the divine nature. So uh, th this is kind of, kind of relativity, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Your own, your own viewpoint, it has got a sovereign quality to it, but it's not subjective. The idea that a viewpoint, you know, uh, on reality that you would have is not just a subjective opinion or a subjective impression, but it's like, you know, you're you're looking at a mountain from a, a particular point of the compass, and of course that you see it that way. You're going to climb this mountain, and this is the north face. You're going to climb the north face. Somebody else is going to climb the east face. Uh, they're going to see it differently. But yet, it truly is the same mountain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, re relativity can can free us in a certain sense from limited views of existence. But on the other hand, it can the, the dark its dark side is it can just make us believe that everything is is a, a subjective opinion and there's no no reality out there really. Mm -hmm. This is what what you get with with wrong interpretations of quantum physics you know oh mm -hmm. there's nothing really out there uh, the, 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 until, until you make a measurement then something <laughs> well, yeah. you created it you know uh but on the other hand somebody else make another measurement at a different place in time create something else and and reality not only becomes becomes purely subjective but but it, it becomes fragment the unity the transcendent unity of being as, as a concept attributed to Ibn al-Arabi uh, becomes lost, you know, it's all, and that, that's what happened with postmodernism. That's what postmodernism is. Postmodernism hates unity. And, and one of the big uh, tributaries to postmodernism is like quantum physics misunderstood, you know, so. Do you think, uh, this is like a side question, but on the same topic in a sense, but it's it's a question that's always, been on my mind as you know i studied different fields within islam but in the field of spirituality tasawwuf in the field of tazkiyatun nafs there's always been an idea of pondering over the universe but it hasn't been that big of a component traditionally speaking meaning when we pick up pick up books on purification of the soul from various centuries various authors you know, they, they've talked about like the disease of the heart or they've talked about different methods of uh, or different prescriptions to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have from now and every now and then like talked about pondering over the heavens. But when you read the Quran, there's a lot of emphasis in that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we now live at an age where this is because of being, and maybe one of the reasons they didn't write that much about it is because they weren't divorced from nature. It wasn't as uh, maybe, yeah. maybe it wasn't felt as much. And now because we're like, you know, I don't see a chicken. I just go to the grocery store and buy the eggs. And I don't, see, I don't, see, I, I may, I don't see that process, the, the divine process taking place. And yeah. so I'm cut off. And so it's, it's, we're, we're, 
in in today's age, I guess my question is that where would you place the the idea of fikr on the khalq samawa the creation of the heavens and the earth, to think about it uh, compared to before and now in well, let's see. Um, the 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 nature of material reality has has become you know big in everybody's consciousness because science you know I mean I mean the, the astronomers put up the James Webb telescope and they're seeing newer and newer things and uh, one of the fascinating things and one of the difficulties is our basic um, image of the cosmos changes maybe even you know faster than than in, in a given generation you know where it's going to get to that point you know it, it, the cosmos used to be stable you know mm. the, the mountains were, were placed on the earth to stabilize it you know mm. and, and then now it's established and and so we we can contemplate the eternity of god by looking at the stars but mm. now the stars are changing like crazy beetlejuice is about to explode and disappear and other things are going on and and you know you know, and, and we, we, our mind goes ahead eons and says, well, how long is the universe going to last? When's it going to end? And what's going to happen then? And all this stuff is going on. So th that very much destabilizes our sense of eternity. So what we need to do is, is because of that sort of negative view of, of, of scientific um, discoveries, not that they're invalid, but, but that they have a, a destabilizing effect on, on our sense of eternity. And because of that, we have to comp compensate by understanding things like, well, all of this is information. You mm -hmm. know, that's, you know, ideas like that become very important. And, mm -hmm. when, and, and, and that, like I say, goes right back to, uh, you know, the universe is, is a book and it's, you know, it's as if written on the guarded tablet, which in alchemical terms would be the, the prima materia, you know, the, the, the invisible primal substance of all things, you know, written by the sublime pen, which is, is God's creative word. And, you know, uh, we, we have to become more sophisticated in, in, in our, our view of uh, the material world or the discoveries of science will completely disarrange us. You know which they're doing mm. so you know it's 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 that kind of you know that kind of need is come i mean it's interesting um you know that there's a book which i haven't read it's called hamlet's mill mm. and talks about part i think it talks about what's now being called the bronze age collapse mm. the, the, there was there was a perfectly ordered conception of the universe at one point mm. based on astronomy mm -hmm. Based, which we still we still you know inherit the astrology from that time it was it was in mesopotamia and perhaps in, in anatolia among the hittites it was very ancient and the whole universe was conceived of as uh, as as a perfectly ordered system which was regular and and you know a system of of religion and of divinities and of priesthoods and of rituals grew up that was entirely in line with that conception of the universe and it created very stable societies hmm. but then what happened is slowly but slowly you had the procession of the equinoxes which hmm. was too slow to see except over a long period of time but suddenly the priests are looking and said wait a minute the universe is out of sync yeah. this is not working anymore and all the compensations they had to do for that, which mm. were stressful. And finally, the point came where they said, look, we can't fix this anymore. Something has gone wrong. Mm. And, and that was one of the, the, um, the, the factors in, in the fall of those ancient Bronze Age civilizations is, is that, you know, the, the, the system of the cosmos didn't work anymore. Well, that's happening to us like like every ten years now. That's that's interesting. You mentioned that. That's so interesting because, you know, from what I have read, that every civilization and every religion has a perception of cosmology, and the cosmology is like the yeah. mirroring of that religion, right? Yeah. So, you look at the uh, universe, 
and that that universe is uh, mirroring the concepts down to earth and so as, as long as that's stable well that's good but if you start i guess uh shifting that yeah especially if it's happening fast then it's like it's very problematic because you got there's no nothing solid to anchor humanity then yeah there are no eternal verities anymore you know, like like you know, you know, gender you know, is, is is something that that could change tomorrow, and maybe we'll all turn into raccoons or something. You know, you know, species. What's that? You know, and and it becomes chaos, and society cannot live that way, and 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 crumbles. Yes. 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 I'm listening to a lecture, both Dean Smith and a bunch of people ah. saying our science should be based on Platonism. Ah. Uh, Descartes and those yes, you know, my, my, my wife Jenny comes in and, and, and she's listening to, to a lecture on, on the same su similar. Oh, subject, interesting, interesting. Uh, 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 by this very important uh, physicist, ma ma mathematician, and metaphysician, Wolfgang Smith, hmm. uh, who, who, you know, he, he's a Christian, but, but he has been very influenced by Hinduism as well. And uh, he's talking about science. You know, need, needs to be founded on Platonism or basically Platonic concepts again, which which you know follows from the idea that matter is basically information. Mm. You know, so his his you know people should look at his uh, website, which is called um, it's the Philos Sophia Philos Dash Sophia Initiative Foundation website, and he's got a lot of videos and things on there. Yeah, he's he's one of the followers of it's Philos Dash Sophia. And he's one of the, the, the very interesting spin-offs of the perennialist movement and and, and for Shun. Mm -hmm. He like like a number yeah, of other yeah. people, yes. He's the very is he's the guy that invented the equations that allow a spacecraft to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere without either either bouncing off or burning up. So, you know, he, he was like a rocket scientist, you know? Hmm. And, uh, but, but, you know, he's, uh, he, his, his view of, of what a metaphysically based science would be is, is very clear and, you know, very, you know, very important for our times. And he, he, he always works against the idea that it's all subjective. You know, he has to establish philosophically the fact that there is actually a world, you mm. know, which we're starting to say, well, it's all it's all uh, in the brain, you know, because it, it's it isn't it isn't really out there or or uh, it, it's all just based upon our measurements. And because we have a particular view of something it, it collapses the wave function and suddenly it becomes real because of us. So we're all magicians. We're, we're magically creating this world right now. And, and of course, God, you know, is, is ejected from the picture at that point. You know, we, we are the creators. Or, and, and the next thing is, but who created us? And the next thing after that is, the UFO aliens created us. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, so a lot of this goes created, back oh to that. God, and it, right. that. That whole, and he's working against that kind of worldview, but by saying, you know, uh, through some very sophisticated philosophy ha having to do with with uh, the theories of visual perception and things that I do not quite understand mm. myself because they're kind of technical but but saying look the world is really there mm. you know and uh we don't like that idea because the world is pretty scary right now we'd mm. rather if it wasn't really there if it was all in our heads then we could just change the channel in our brain and everything would be would be all right you know, it's 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 a flight from reality, based partly on fear, but also based upon a lot of scientific discoveries, which are um, really destroying our earlier senses of what objective reality would be. So now we we need now, for example, we need things like Asherite Kalam uh, and and its doctrine of occasionalism, which says Allah creates the universe anew in each moment of time. Hmm. That that now becomes something, which which helps keep uh, God in the picture, 
mm. if, if we can see that kind of thing. Now, this is this is one of the, the questions, though, about, you know, people uh, who've been trying to say, well, well, where did Islam's preeminence in so many of the sciences at one point in, in the Middle Ages, where did that come from? Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, the great mathematicians, great astronomers, great, you know, I mean, what Avicenna, Ibn Sina knew about so many things, you know, uh, uh, you know, m making a practical connection between metaphysics and and natural philosophy or science, which made him an amazing healer, mm. you know, uh, an amazing physician, you know, all that, where did all that knowledge come from? Because what, what the, what the uh, maybe the Orientalists or people who are looking at Islam from the outside say, well, <laughs> it couldn't have come from, from the Quran because the Quran is, is all saying, you know, you know, everything comes from the will of Allah and, and uh, uh, you know, whatever he say, says goes and, and if fire burns, it's not because, uh, you know, the, the, there's a reducing agent, which is the fuel and an oxidizing agent, which is oxygen. And they make a chemical reaction, you know, producing heat, which requires heat to initiate, to be initiated. None of that, you know, could mean anything to Muslims because they just believe God did. So they're not even so, but but yet, look what they were able to do in terms of science and in terms of of, of uh, discerning natural law. And so the Orientalists and people like them will say, well, they got it all from the Greeks. Hmm. You know, it wasn't in the Quran. It was just they left the Quran aside and, you know, and, and went to Greek science and and they they had the uh, a lot of the old manuscripts and they translated them in Baghdad and and this is where it all came from. Well, okay, but it, it is in the Quran. I'm sorry, you know, and th there was a tension, which you can see with, with Al Ghazali, with, between you know the, the the excessive Greek rationalism of like the the Mutazilites and um, you know a, a, a something that's r really Quranically based, and and so Al Ghazali did a balance, a balancing, a rebalancing of that of that dichotomy. But this does not mean that there's no, no uh, appreciation or open door to science in the Quran. It's, it's there everywhere. I mean, the, the Quran talks about natural law was um, authored by Allah. And, and it, it, he, he isn't, because he recreates the whole universe in every instant, if you want to look at it that way, this doesn't mean he's arbitrary. You know, he recreates it rhythmically and harmoniously, and that is natural law. So mm -hmm. he's the author of natural law as well. The thing is, he can suspend the law whenever he wishes because he's the creator of it. Mm -hmm. And so you have miracles. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these are the breaking of habits, and yet the habits still remain as habits, you know, to create an ordered universe. And, and that's all there in the Quran. And uh, so, so we have to realize that, that science you know, science in Islam was just was not just something artificially grafted on to the tradition, you know, of th through, uh, you know, th through the Greeks, a any more than Sufism was something that was artificially grafted on the tradition through uh, Christianity or Buddhism or Central Asian shamanism or whatever people think it came from. It comes directly from the Quran, just just like the, pre the, the, the scientific uh, preeminence of Islam came from the Quran. So. Yeah, um, on that, uh, Professor uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasr. Yes. Even though I have profound difference of opinions with him on some issues, but I think oh. one of the positive aspects of his life's endeavor has been, I think he's basically proven uh, from his works that and I think that was one of his main objectives was to show that the Islamic civilization grew to be where it was because of its theology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he did a very good job on that. And, you know, he has in his works in different ways, he's approached it. But I think the most simple way is the collection of statements of these scientists that in their works, they you know, it's not like a book of science today where it doesn't mention God. These were works wow. that were on optics or what, uh, you know, the circulatory system. Um, 
but they were mentioning a lot in their works all the time and yeah. i think it increased their iman their faith that you know that they're they're able to discover the um the universe and in fact uh traditionally on that same point uh from another perspective you know our is the 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 classical islamic curriculum to become an alim to become a scholar of islam you had to learn plato and socrates like you had to learn that was part of the islamic curriculum it's not there anymore because you don't have 14 years to study anymore but yeah you know it now recently it's been you know for the last 50 60 years it's been reduced to seven years and then sometimes less than that but the original curriculum that was made by the scholars of the 12th century uh studying socrates studying logic studying mantic studying plato was yeah, an integral yeah. so that, it was that, all integrated similar to, to, to the seven liberal arts in in uh, in western education yeah which you know strictly analogous not identical but you know and uh who who got the most from who i imagine christianity derived a great deal of the idea of the seven liberal arts from uh, from islam you know so, but also you know through it through its own because you know the the, the christians had their own connection um with with the greeks you know through, through through the church fathers and you know so that they 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 were not co totally cut off from greek wisdom uh but but uh you know the the christian curriculum or the christian worldview got a big boost when uh, the islamic um philosophers like uh, ibn rushd and uh, ibn sina began to be studied uh by by the western you know scholastic philosophers that that was that was a big renewal of of the christian uh, intellectual tradition which but it, but uh the christians didn't get all their their knowledge of the greeks from, from the muslims but and and the muslims actually got a lot of their knowledge from the byzantines because that was the source that was the uh, yeah yeah of of, of, of the um uh, of the manuscripts uh, of, of the Greek philosophers that uh, that they were working on uh, to translate into Arabic, and it's it's interesting. I forget the name of of, of the actual manuscript, but there there was something. Um, it was it was something on the philosophy of Plato, but it was entirely Aristotelian or something like that. In other words, Aristotle and Plato, uh, or or or. or I forget the story, but Muslim uh, scholars mistook something by Aristotle for something written by Plato, hmm. because of the title was 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 you know misquoted or something like this, which was very interesting though, because then they had to say, well, isn't it interesting? We have such different conceptions here. So how could Plato and you know they they ended up. Uh, uh, synthesizing the ideas of Plato and Aristotle because they thought that it was all written by Plato anyway, so they had to figure it out, which wasn't invalid because we forget that Aristotle himself was a Platonist. He just took he took it, uh, you know, something that was inherent in Platonism, a particular possible way of looking at things, and then you know went on, went his own way with that as as his background. But his teacher was Plato. So it was all, you know, it was all good. You know? <laughs> so. and, and I don't know what you would say to this. Maybe I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but just as, you know, you have mechanical physics uh, and then you have quantum physics, uh, kind of like it, you have in the beginning with Plato, Aristotle, like idealism versus realism, right? Uh, and so the well, idea well, actually, is... Actually, Idealism, uh, realism is is pretty much uh, synonymous with idealism. Um, realism is is the name in scholastic philosophy for what has come to be called Platonic idealism. Mm. What, what, what the, the distinction was uh, between Plato and Aristotle, uh, Plato considered the ideas as, as a realm of reality in themselves, almost like contemplation of the divine names, the names mm -hmm. of God. Whereas 
Aristotle said, people think Aristotle said, hmm. no, the, the, the ideas only exist in, 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 in terms of their material manifestation. Hmm. But it's possible that, that he said, what I'm going to do is concentrate on how these ideas appear in, in material manifestation. Not that he denied Plato, he was just doing something else. He was looking to taking another perspective on the same basic set of, of concepts. And uh, so, you know, he came up with this hilomorphic theory that everything, everything that has substantial form, every real thing is a union of an underlying material, uh, you know, substance and, and, and a divine, quasi-divine form or essence. And, and, and the, the union of these two um, produces everything that we see in you know, all real things, mm -hmm. which is profound. And then this is something that the alchemists took and ran with. You know, in in both um, the Christian world and the Muslim world, I mean, some what what uh, Aristotle said right there could, could be called the goal of alchemy. If you bring together, you know, form and substance, you know, you've created the philosopher's stone. You know, something like this. It, 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 and then, um, you know, th then you look at Dante's Dante's tradition of the fidele d'amore the faithful to love. And we don't know who these people exactly were, but some have claimed that they had a great influence from the uh, Shadili tradition of, of Interesting. Tasawuf. Interesting. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know who, who, who is exactly first claimed that or can prove it, but that's what some people see. <laughs> and it had to do with, um, I call it uh, esoteric Aristotelianism. You know, and, and th th this is taking us a little out of the realm of science into the realm of, of uh, Western r romantic tradition. But what you would have. And you've written a book on that. When yeah, I was, your, your book actually, title. I happen to have it right here. I can find it. Yeah, this is another one. And, and, and that this is, um, can you get that? Yeah. You wrote it with your wife, I think. Yeah. Shadow yeah. of the Rose. Shadow of the Rose, the Esoterism, the Romantic Tradition. And th this has got, you know, um, a, a lot about, you know, the, the similarities and differences between Ibn al-Arabi and, and, you know, the, the, the Western Romantic or if, if not even Arthurian tradition, you know, and, and, and uh, the similarities and differences between Western uh, chivalry and um, Eastern Futuwa. Mm. Um, because, do you see it? I know this is so out of science, but do you see this yeah. is just uh, because I am very interested in the subject of fatua, and I think that the like my dream, in a sense, one of my dreams is mm -hmm. to merge the subwoof and fatua into one. As as they once were at in certain places and times. Yes. Yeah. and so. Is there a difference between Western chivalry and uh, Islamic chivalry, or are they? Well, it, 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 judging from uh, who is it, Salimi's? Um, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, book, book on Futuwa. What, what yes. was its title? Um, anyway, uh, Kit you know, Kitab al Futuwa, I think it's called. Isn't it called Kitab al Futuwa? His book. Yeah, I'm just thinking of you know. The, I think I think so. It's about I just don't remember the English translation. You know, book of Sufi chivalry or something like. That. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, well, sh chivalry was was the sense of of humane and self um, self effacing uh, human relations. You know that 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 it it essentially took adab and also a love of justice. Uh, as far as you could in human relations to, to, to a point uh, uh, where, you know, there would be a self-sacrificial element sometimes. You know, the Futawa Brotherhoods, now who, who, is, who is the caliph who uh, founded uh, his own order of Futawa? There was one, I forget which one, and, and it, th th that was like a kingly, knightly Futu, you know, I mean the 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 uh, you know the cavalry, 
because yeah. that's what chivalry means essentially in, in, in French is cavalry, you know, the, the, you know, the, those, those military um, units who rode horses and who, mm. and, and who were often in history, the aristocratic element, you know, as opposed to the foot soldiers who are more the common people. That's certainly the way it was in the West. Mm. I mean, um, so, um, it, but th then it's very interesting when, when that uh, a chivalric order, you know, fell into a decline, a lot of the elements of Futuwa became connected with the craft guilds in, in the Islamic world. And the strange thing is the same thing happened when the Templars were suppressed in the Western world, Templar influences became connected with the craft guilds, particularly with the Masons. Hmm. The same thing happened. We, and what is that? I don't hmm. know why, but that you can just, you, you can see that parallel. So anyway, um, the, 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 there's a, a Nimatullahi Dervish. Uh, when I was associated with the Nimatullahi Sufi order under Dr. Javad Nurbaksh out of I Iran. And he said, uh, well, uh, Futuwa, you know, uh, th th for me, the image of, of Western Futuwa comes from that movie, Miracle on 34th Street, Miracle where there's this crazy Street. old guy who thinks he's the real Santa Claus. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right. And, and uh, you know, and, and he has he interacts with with some very worldly people who don't believe in Santa Claus, a little girl, you know, who says, oh, I don't believe in Santa Claus because my, my parents are are materialists, you know, <laughs> something like this. And he, I mean, he, so he shows himself somehow to be the real Santa Claus. But what's interesting is is an incident where where the, the, there is someone working in, in one of the department stores in New York I think I think he was who uh you know is is sort of overweight and 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 awkward and people make fun of him and you know and and, and an evil psychiatrist comes and try, tries to say that he's mentally ill and he needs to be you know placed in an institution or something like this and and he's just defended by, by uh, Chris Kringle, you know, the, the Santa Claus figure. And, you know, in, in, in very serious terms, who, who like bops the psychiatrist on the head and say, leave him alone, you know, because this is a person who, who has no social power, you know? I mean, I mean he's, he, he, he is in a position where he's going to get um, oppressed by all, by many different elements of a society as it's set up, not because he's a bad person or because he's done anything wrong, just because he doesn't live up to the social mythology. Mm. And so he, 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 is, he is persecuted. And Chris Kringle defended him, you know, and, and this, this dervish of the Namatalai order said, that to me is the spirit of Futuwa. Mm. So there is, and, and of course, Chris Kringle gets in trouble because he bopped the psychiatrist. And so now the psychiatrist is gonna to try to get him committed you know, because he's a crazy old man, and then, but then he wins because he convinces everybody that he's really Santa Claus or something. But anyway, um, that's very interesting. That, that, that there was that quality of of uh, of, of care care for, for 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 the for the oppressed care, and care for those who are psychologically oppressed in a society, and you know, and and that's that's a deep element of chivalry. What Eastern Futuwa did not have, as far as I can see, was the union of chivalry and romance. <coughs> interesting. And heterosexual love. Now, what's interesting is there, there were other elements of, you know, of romance which were coming from Islam. They were not united with Futuwa, but they were coming through the Persian romances like of Leila and Majnun and of the Udri poets of, of, of uh, I think they were pre-Islamic poets, but who who, who would, you know, um, you know, write write poems in praise of uh, the lady that they were in love with, even even though they would never be united with her, and maybe she was married to someone else, and they would praise her, and 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 they would, you know, they would uh, su suffer and die for her because they could never be united with her, or things like this. Mm -hmm. Those tendencies all came together in Western romance, 
And but in Western romance, the difference is that, that you know, sh chivalry and 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 the, the sense of of self abnegation and self sacrifice and um, and romance um, became united on many levels. And, and, and what you have, and, and the Fidelia d'Amore, who, who were either an actual initiatory order, like a Western Sufi order, or were just a, a, a loose uh, association of artists and poets that, that Dante knew. We don't know who they were. You know, it's just one. So, yeah. so okay, so that's very interesting. So, uh, we have a very strong fatua in terms of being selfless and serving khidma, yeah. in terms of uh, being great with the bow and the arrow and great with the horses and all that. Uh, but the extra dimension, I guess, that played a, a larger role in the Western paradigm was romance. Yeah, uh, and, and like I say, that, that was also <laughs> present in Islam, but it just, it hadn't dovetailed yet with Futawa, and then it finally did when it got to the West. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see if we can get back to science here. Yes. Uh, the, the, okay, so, so I, I'm calling the Fidelia de More, um, I'm saying they're practicing a kind of esoteric Aristotelianism because in that system, mm. you know, the, the, the beautiful lady hard to attain is, you know, that, that, that's the idea of, of the lady the knight is in love with. And in, in real terms, she was often uh, the wife of, of, of a lord. And so she was effectively uh, unavailable to him. But the Lord might well have gone to the Crusades. He was not around, and she was made regent of his realm while he was fighting in the Holy Land. And so uh, you would have, you know, troubadours who, who would come and, and write poems to her beauty and this and this, maybe hoping for a handout, maybe once in a while consummating an actual adultery. We don't know, you know, that, that, that was not out of the realm of possibility. This wasn't all a spiritual thing. You know, it was a very worldly kind of thing that got spiritualized mm -hmm. you know, somewhere along the line. Partly when the Albigensian crusade, uh, which was launched by the papacy in, in, in alliance with the, uh, the lords and nobles of Northern France um, attacked Southern France, Aquitaine, and Languedoc and uh, destroyed that society because there, there was an alternate heretical and is often called Manichaean church developing there called the Cathars or the Albigenses, mm. which who, who had a, 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 a counterpart in, in, in the Eastern world called the Bogomils. You know, in, in the world that, that's now the world of Eastern Orthodox Christianity, this was sort of a world church that that could have supplanted the Catholic Church. So the Catholic says enough of this. But what's strange is, is in that world you had both a very world-denying kind of Gnostic <coughs> quasi-Christianity, where, where one of the pious acts would be to starve yourself to death because mm -hmm. we're to have no contact, we're, you know, not to touch this world because this world. Is all fallen and is all evil. Mm. At the same time, you have this very worldly, romantic, and and, and sexual kind of uh, strand of the troubadours, mm. you know, and 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 they 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 strangely enough form parts of the same society. Well, that was all busted in the Albigensian Crusade, and the the troubadours that remained, uh, this either decided or were only allowed, sort of by law, to to write their uh, love poems to the Virgin Mary, mm. only to the Virgin Mary. That, that was all that was allowed anymore. So they said, well, we're going to continue and we will write our poems to the Virgin Mary. And that's where the term Our Lady came from. Uh, oh, interesting. Applied to the Virgin Mary. Like our, you know, this is not one of the old the ladies we used to uh, write our poems for who, who was the, the, uh, the, the wife of some lord in Southern France. This is our one lady, you mm. know, Our Lady. 
And that term actually came from St. Bernard, uh, Our Lady, who wrote the, um, the, uh, the or orders, the, the, the uh, what do you say, you know, the charters, the rules of the Templars. He, oh, he, he, interesting. Came up, he came up with their, you know, okay, you, you're going to be a spiritual chivalric order. Well, I, I'm going to write, write your rule. And he did. And it, the, there was, a, it's one of the sort of Ardis did the same for Eastern Futur, hmm. you know, which is a, a saint writing the rule for a knightly order. It's just the, the, the correspondences are, are so interesting. And I don't know if anybody's figured out you know, why there was such a correspondence, but it certainly was. So anyway, the Fidelia de Mora... You know, that's that's interesting because uh, uh, Abu Hassan Shadri, I mean, he was... Uh, that was like jihad and tasawwuf like in one, in, in his personality. And uh, you get the burda from his lineage too. Uh, the the cloak of the prophet, the, the famous poem that's the most it's like the most famous poet islamic poetry that's been the most famous for i don't know almost yeah. well almost a thousand years now and that's one of his grand students that wrote that but that was on love of the prophet yeah so i i well, think our romanticism became instead of man and woman it was really the love of the prophet that yeah yeah and you know, and, but the, but the man, the man and woman thing was there too. You know, I mean, look. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, there. Uh, 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 Layla was obviously the beautiful lady, hard to attain. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, Majnun, You know, she, 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 she was kept jealously guarded by her family, who didn't want her marrying this crazy, you know, Sufi or poet or whatever he was, this madman, this jinn possessed Majnun running around in the wilderness <laughs> living with animals. They they, they, they didn't. They didn't want that. And so, but what's interesting, the beautiful lady hard to attain becomes a type of God. Because mm. God, you know, God is like Layla. God is invisible. She's night. Mm. You can't see her. She's in darkness. You know, wow. you okay. yet you know she's there. But somehow she is the greatest, the most beautiful, even though you can't see her. She's mm. veiled, you know, and um it's very much the same with uh, with the Western like uh, courtly romances. You know, the the the, the knight uh, falls in love with the lady, and the lady, you know, appears cruel to him, and all this. Well, he, she's cruel simply because she has no needs. Mm. He, he is nothing but need, and mm. she is is self sufficient. Mm. So, who is self sufficient really? But God, only God is. You know, al samad, the self sufficient, mm. right? And so, uh, but but he he is is like like the devotee or the worshiper who who has to um, come to terms with his needs and moderate his his, his lust and 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 his his longing you know and it, his lust and his longing are the motive factors of of his whole quest and yet he has to moderate them and and cha and chasten them if he's ever going to attain the lady because he has to come to the place where where she is and that is a place of of the self-sufficiency of god so he has to accept that and if he mm. accepts that you know and and changes and develops his character in uh in line with that then uh then they can be united you know the, one of the the uh uh, the most important man, uh, uh, romances is the, the Parsifal of, of Chrétien de Troyes, which was later developed as the Parsifal, Parsif with a V or Parsifal of uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach, which is the greatest of the Arthurian romances and completely alchemical in mm -hmm. every sense. I mean, the alchemical lore in there is just will blow your mind. But the earlier one was Parsifal by Chrétien de Troyes. And uh, Parsifal is a young fool, you know, he's, he's raised by his, his father is dead, his father was a knight, but he's going up and died, and, and his son is being raised only by his mother, and, 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 and he's just a mama's boy, he doesn't know anything else but, but his home and his mother, and his mother never wants him to become a knight, because that's how her husband died, so she wants to protect him, and so he says, but he, but he sees a knight once, he says, 
Why, what are you? <coughs> well, no, actually, young man, I'm a knight. Do you know what a knight is? Never heard of it. Yeah. I want to be one, you know? And, and, so, and so he says, sorry, mom, I'm going off to be a knight, whatever that is. And she says, no, no. He says, well, forget it. You know, I have to, I have to, do, got to do what I got to do. So he goes off completely untutored, untrained, undeveloped with zero adab. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and he goes and he, and he sees a, pr- a, a pretty girl and he says, well, my mother says I should, I should kiss pretty girls probably because she didn't want him to be gay. So she, he just grabs, grabs her and, she, you know, and he gets in trouble and he, and, 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 and he does all these crazy things. And he, but he finally ends up at, at uh, Arthur's court and he says, hi, you guys are knights, eh? I want to be a knight too. I said, well, uh, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> and, and then somehow he, he, he gets into a conflict with, with, with one of the, the very proficient and, and well-trained knights and ends up killing, him, you know, and, and, and they look at this, they say, this guy is, this kid, you know, is a diamond in the rough. He seems pretty, you know, un, untutored, but I mean, without training, he was able to, 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 to conquer this great warrior. Wow. So the whole story is, is Parsifal uh, growing out of, of his childish impulsiveness mm. or, or his being 100% nafs, if you will, mm. and growing through a daub and, 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 and through, you know, through, through you know, conflicts and, and through sacrifices, you know, to, to, to develop a full human character. And when he does, then he's able to be united with his, with his lady. You know, mm. and so this is the story. And so, in Aristotelian terms, what you say is, the lady is form, is forma, because she's complete, and yet she's just an image. She's just a vision. She hasn't been incarnated. She hasn't become real in this world. Whereas mm. the knight is is unformed potential, potentia, or materia, and and he's full of impulses and full of needs, and he he has to become formed in his relationship to his lady who is formed whereas she has to become uh more real and, and more comp- more more you know complete in this world through her relationship to him so they come together and when you're united that that is aristotle's substantial form you know according to his hylomorphic theory and so this is is what uh the uh Fidelia de Mora really understood from Aristotle is, is that, that he could be a spiritual way. Hmm. But I don't think they could have gotten that if similar ideas were developing with, within Islam, particularly within alchemy. Because hmm. alchemy, th- th- this, is, this is the story of alchemy projected outward as romance. You know, somewhere I wrote, I, I said, uh, romance is the alchemy of the outer world. Alchemy is the romance of the inner world. Hmm. You know, and so, you know, that, that's a very interesting tradition that, that produced the greatest poet of, of the Christian West. So what's uh, coming back to Quran and science, um, what's also interesting is the formation of the day and the night. And these are like signs of Allah, but they also synch- they're also synchronized because they're they're synchronized with morality meaning uh so so there's the quran and the creation and the quran uses the allegory of the day and the night also in the moral sense but we also understand it in the metaphorical sense so it's not just limited to oh this is a sign that allah exists or that allah is so beautiful uh and he created beautiful things but it's also the merging of the creation is a sign at multiple levels including moral things i guess that's yeah and and, and including the signs of spiritual states because d- day and night are, are are like perhaps like expansion and contraction or like sobriety and drunkenness or like presence and absence those paired states that the sufis recognize and and that you know if if we do a little introspection we'll see that we're all subject to states like that in one way or another because because we're changeable 
but the changes are not just chaotic. You know, they're, they're you know, and, and there's a different adab for every state. Hmm. Well, this is, the, I mean, and, and of course, certain things are to be done in the day. This, this is the, the cycle of the daily prayer or the salah. Certain things are to be done at certain hours, you know, and then other things are to be done at night. And, and, and so, you know, the, 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 and, and the idea in Ramadan, you fast during the day and, and you feast, you know, during, you know, the, the nighttime hours is, is, is all a way of conforming the changes of the human soul to the regularity of the changes of, of, of the universe and seeing them as strictly analogous. Hmm. So in your essay, uh, I think you start off talking about Quran and earth. Let me see what I said. I haven't read that in a while. <laughs> Sometimes I write things and they disappear. And then I have to say, did I write, did I write that? <laughs> so uh, let's see if I can find that. I have to minimize you from my point of view for a second here. Yeah, so these, so anyway, I say, yeah, the meaning of the earth and the Quran, I have 16 different themes, uh, which I see, you know, are, are the, the way the Quran talks about the natural world, and secondarily, you know, the, the uh, you know, the scientific truths and realities that, that can be discerned through that uh, correspondence. So I say, uh, the earth in the Quran has four basic meanings. One, it is the field of human endeavor, both legitimate and corrupt. Mm. Right? Interesting. Two, okay. it's an instance of Allah's generosity to humanity. Mm. Three, it is a similitude or an image of paradise. Mm. Four, it is something that should not be worshipped because it's going to end. Mm. And according to meanings two and three, clearly we are required to care for the earth as part of our submission to Allah. Mm. So, um, you know, and I'm just very I beautiful. Say, in fact, I think you summed up the Quranic view of earth in a very beautiful way. Yeah, yeah because, you know, it's, 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 it's the, um, the field composed only of the signs of Allah, but we don't, we don't worship the signs as if they were the thing that they are signs of. We, we, we see through them. Actually, William Blake has a wonderful little uh, paragraph that he wrote, which relates to this. He says, I question not, which I think he means I consult not, but the, the actual phrase is, I question not my corporeal or vegetative eye, my physical eye, any more than I would question a window concerning sight. I look through it, not with it. Mm. That is so profound. Because what, what we need to do and what the Quran, you know, teaches us to do, if we pay attention, is to look through the signs, uh, you know, through the, the forms and the processes of the natural world, not with. If you look with them, you say, well, these are the parameters of reality. And, you know, uh, you know that the, they are what they appear to be. We can penetrate more and more deeply into them in terms of mathematics and, and and measurements and stuff and stuff. But they don't really point to anything beyond them, beyond. Mm. Them, you know, maybe that, if that reminds me, have you heard of Saint Lucy? Saint Lucy. Saint Lucy. He was a great scholar of Turkey after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Oh. And oh, he single-handedly brought turkey out of uh you can say uh radical secularism that it was in, yeah. and, 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 in and into Ottoman into the light that it is now he's the oh. the main character why did i i did not know about him i mean yeah he is just amazing quality. person he's just an amazing person but i want to first tell you this what you were saying and i want to reflect upon what Said nursi said Said nursi wrote a book called the Risala, or it's it's a series of writings of his. 
It's about 5,000 pages. It's a commentary on the Quran. Just amazing. One of the best commentaries of Quran in the modern context because he continues, like his purpose was to bring down atheism and secularism. And, uh, you know, he was in prison and just a whole bunch of things. But in re reflection to what you were saying, he gives this parable. He says, there's a king and he says, I have a book. I want you to write a report on my book. And so the mm -hmm. philosopher, scientist philosopher takes the book and the believer takes the book. And now they come back with their reports. And the philosopher scientist is like, well, this book is made of this many jewels and these jewels weigh this much. And yeah. the and number of pages and and and, and exactly, yes. Yeah. So they is, look, you know, <clears throat> and so that's his report. And the believer is like, you know, it's it's a beautiful book, but this is the message of the book. This is what the book is trying to say. And so he gives this parable, say And I, I found what you were saying similar to that in, in a sense. Yeah, uh, the message, I mean, the, the, the Quran, there's been this tendency to almost consider it to be impious to ask what the message of the Quran is. And, the, and of course, it's very important, and, and this is an art that I don't have, you know, to understand the original Arabic and, and you know, Quranic recitation is, is a powerful thing, you know, and, 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 and uh, this is all wonderful. But if you don't understand the message, that then it, is, it becomes kind of superstition. You know, uh, you 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 you'll take a surah of the Quran and write it in tiny script and make an amulet out of it and wear it around. But will you ever want to read that surah and understand? It? You know, so so in other words, it goes in the direction, strangely enough, of magic, without mm. it, without the, the the element of, and we're here to understand it. That's why it came in the clear Arabic tongue. That's what it meant. Every you all know Arabic, so listen to what it says. Listen to what it means. You know. Interesting. Yeah, so that uh, parable that uh, William Blake, I yeah. think William Blake gave is very interesting. Oh, William uh, Blake, William Blake is, he's the cl he closest thing. I mean, he's so close to being really heterodox and, and bad news from a Christian standpoint, but he, but really he's, he's saved he, he he provided a bridge from the earlier world of the Middle Ages and, and the understanding of the church fathers through sort of the most materialistic philosophical phase of Western civilization almost, which mm. we strangely enough call the Enlightenment, you know, mm -hmm. and and th th through through to, to our times, you know, and, and, and you know, he, he was almost heterodox, he was almost a Gnostic, he was very close to being bad, but he's been so helpful to so many people. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I remember reading about how he was so anti-capitalism and um, I think yeah, was... anti, anti or anti, uh, you know, imperialism. I mean, he, he was because he, he was at the time when, uh, you know, the, the American Revolution was happening and he, and he saw the American Revolution was was a breath of fresh air to. Uh, you know, to to save save the, the the British, the English, American soul from the oppression of of, of materialism, and and particularly of material of a uh, of uh, imperialism. Hmm. So, yeah. So um, okay. So uh, the Earth has these components. Okay. So how does this? Where do you place? I guess. Okay. Let me just back up a little bit um in terms of epistemology so why don't i say something and then we'll come back to earth from yeah. that perspective yeah. uh and then um so you in the beginning you have the perennial questions okay and then from there you have natural philosophy almost for the whole history almost right and well, you have philosophy. No, first you have philosophy. Sorry. So you have the perennial questions, which leads to uh, philosophy. And it, in the beginning, 
I guess everything was part of philosophy, even mathematics, even everything, right? Yeah, pretty much, you know, or uh, you can't quite say part of theology, but, you know, not, not, uh, not alienated from theology anyway, so. Yeah, <clears throat> and so this concept of, I see there's so many things that we can dive into, but uh, let's start with, I, I don't know if you're if you're interested in talking about scientism, uh, just backing up a little oh, bit. Yeah, scientism, yeah. I mean, and it won't, one, once again, one of the greatest critics of science, well, critics of scientism, Sayyid Hussein Nasser and Wolfgang Smith could be considered to be the next step after, you know, Sayyid Hussein Nasser. Certainly he's very familiar with Nasser's writings because he was associated with a with a traditionalist or perennialist school under Fritjof Schoen at one point. Right, right, yeah. Although although he you know had problems with Schoen later. But um so um Nasser could talk about hi historically what a sacred science or a science which was not separated from a sacred worldview uh was and he and he keeps saying and we need to renew this mm. for our time. And, and, and it's Wolfgang Smith who, as it were, took up that challenge and said, all right, this is how we can begin to renew it in practical terms. Hmm. You know, now, whether practical terms mean technical terms, you know, I mean, maybe a little later for that. I mean, there, there, there was a whole technology that we don't understand anymore, with what alchemy was capable of doing uh, technically. You know, we, we, we're not sure... Could they make gold? If if so, how did they do that? You know, mm -hmm. um, what's interesting uh, that not everybody knows is that uh, Sir Isaac Newton was an alchemist. He wrote more on alchemy than he did on uh, on the the the, uh, the laws of motion and, and and what he's famous for now. Mm -hmm. So you know, he and he he definitely saw uh, natural law as as confirming faith. Mm, yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. And and and, but but by the time Blake came along, and by the time we were in the uh, what's called the Enlightenment in, in Western Europe, um, you you would have a religious, you would have a theology called deism. And what deism was, is the response of Christian theology, and a very poor response it was, to uh, the discoveries of of the physical sciences, which were beginning to pile up. And, you know, and Newton was one of the major, you know, figures in those discoveries. And um, uh, essentially, deism said, well, you know, so much can be explained by natural law. So does that mean there's no God? Well, no. God just, you know, authored the natural laws at the beginning of time. He started everything rolling. And then he just let it go on on its own. He has yeah. no real active relationship with it anymore there's no providence you know but uh, but certainly there must have been a god who started this whole thing if the universe is a watch you know who created the watch and who wound it up it must have been god but then now the watch can exist on its own without without god and that's was deism and 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 william blake was one of the greatest critics of deism you know mm. and you know he was talking he has a poem mock on mock on voltaire rousseau mock on mock on is all in vain you know uh you know uh the 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 uh philosophers of the french revolution and of the the development of scientism which which is making science a, a self enclosed ideology that uh, was designed essentially to replace religion. Mm. Uh, he was one of the greatest critics of that, you know, fr from a, a mystical and visionary standpoint. Mm. So, you know, people, if people w w want to uh, criticize scientism, by all means, read William Blake. That's another one of his great contributions. But scientism, I mean, well, that's what we've got nowadays. We, we uh, can't science explain everything. Do we need God? Mm. There are there are people on the cutting edges of physics who who are starting to say, well, we do need God. There, there, there are people who who have been atheists all their lives, but they 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 learn, you know, the, the, the discoveries of modern physics keep coming, and 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 they ponder them, and they said, well, wait a minute, there's no explanation for this except as an intelligent designer must 
must have, have created this and must be involved in this. And mm -hmm. so they become believers through science. And one of the things that, that Wolfgang Smith uh, uh, keeps emphasizing is that science has disproved materialism. That's true. You know? Yeah. And, and, but, but nobody knows that because the ideology of scientism continues to maintain that 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 science you know has has supported materialism as against any belief in God. That's not where science is. You know, uh, uh, the, the the human you know the the collective view of what science is is like a century a century uh, uh, out of out of uh, out of sync. You know, I mean, I mean things have have gone way beyond that. But still, we're going back to think. Well, you know, uh, you know, G G Galileo saw, saw that uh, you know the the sun, the Earth went around the sun, and and uh, you know he he was the proponent of the physical sciences, and the, the narrow-minded church suppressed him because you know that they they were living in in, in you know old superstitious worldview uh, where where you believe in God. So we still have that. That idea that, that that science has disproved God. Carl uh, Sagan was was one of the great uh, proponents of that worldview. You know, who was a popularizer of science, mm. but he was not on the cutting edge of physics. And those on the cutting edge of physics are finding God again. But that story has not gotten through to to the people at large because of the mythology of scientism that is still there, and to, and and you know, people don't realize how. Uh, how close the whole theory of evolution is just to, you know to, to falling by its own dead weight because there are so many challenges to it and, and exceptions to it that are coming from science itself this story is not being told hmm. and and this is what wolfgang smith wants to tell you know because scientism is like old hat uh and, and yeah i thomas, mean uh what is his name thomas, thomas kuhn uh Thomas Kuhn wrote the book uh, "Structures of Structures of." I forget his book. It's yeah, it's I, I I remember I, the name is familiar, but I don't really you know know much about what he wrote. Yeah, I mean he he basically talked about how different. I mean he talked about a lot of things, but the ones that struck me was how he talked about different branches of science oppose one another. So, for example. He talked about in physics how the ions move. Uh, I think somebody can correct me, but it's it's one or the other. In 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 physics, the ions they are supposed to move counterclockwise, but in chemistry, they the same subject in the same situation they say it moves clockwise. You know, so uh, he was talking about how he's the one who invented the word uh, paradigm shift. Thomas Kuhn oh. is his name. That's big. And, and but he 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 looked at it from a perspective of that if things continue in the trajectory that they're in, or that's one of his main themes, that they will begin to they'll come into a point of contradiction. Yes. Uh, within within the different fields of science. And yes, and, I can see that. Yeah, I agree with that. And so that's that was his one of his critiques of 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 because I, I think I read that book I don't know it was a long long time ago so I probably don't remember all of it but it was a really good book it was one of the books that opened my eyes to other books like Against Method um, and and I really began to um, see how and in the scientific method really hasn't as a method hasn't really produced anything i mean it, it it's it's all been discoveries that were not based upon a scientific method <laughs> yeah i i mean i mean how many things that we know do not have to do with repeatable experiments yeah <laughs> they, they have to do with 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 you know i mean what it's a telescope discovers about the universe is not a repeatable experiment we cannot repeat the big bang to see if it really happened or how it happened right yeah so so that, that's the scientific method has been very mystified at least you know yeah i mean as uh, so maybe in the corporate world you know they do trial and error trial and error and they figure something out using using but it's 
I remember reading somewhere in some book of psychology that uh, the scientific method is almost imbued in human beings, meaning in a sense that you don't have to, it's like gravity, it always existed, and then somebody can claim they discovered it, that's fine, as a concept, that's fine. Somebody can say they discovered scientific the scientific method, that's fine too, but it's what they've, dis what they're, in, in this case, it's so much part of human beings, the idea of trial and error. We make assumptions, we test the assumptions, we yeah. change our assumptions. I mean, there's nothing special about it. Right. That's, <laughs> that's always going to be a part of, of science, but, but that, that's, that's not the big framework in which science actually exists. That's one of the methods. Yeah, right? that's one of the methods, yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, I, I want you to explain what you just said a little bit more. Maybe I can learn something from that. So that's the scientific method. How are you, I guess, separating that from scientists? Or I guess you're looking at it as two different things. Well, uh, it's, 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 um, it's the mystification of a scientific method. It's the invocation. Scientism invokes the scientific method. Well, you see, we learned all this through the scientific method, you know, and and, and which does not require... Uh, anything beyond the existence of matter. Well, I mean, that's not true. And that, that said, simply, I mean, what, what science is doing now is rediscovering God while, while at the same time trying to, uh, you know, to invalidate religion. Hmm. Because the scientists ultimately, I believe, want to be the new priests. And, and they, they, they have to, to de-legitimize the old priests before they can assume that. Uh, That's a very that interesting point. Um, and and the, the way they're beginning very rapidly and very powerfully to assume the position of priests is through the UFO phenomenon and the idea, now we accept the UFO phenomenon. And, um, you know, you, you, you can see this whole thing working out in, 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 in that framework. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, the, the, the idea that, that uh, the worship of UFOs is being groomed to be the, the true world religion. People mm. talk about, well, what's the one world religion going to be? Is it going to be an amalgam of all the other religions? Well, that'll never happen because the other religions are always going to be wrangling among each other. And, you know, and how, you know, what's this? And, well, I think, you know, when people have not been looking at what's been developing in the UFO field and they look at that still you know, up until very recently as, as, a, as a cranky, fringy thing. And now suddenly it's being accepted by the powers that be in the Pentagon and the Congress. And you say, well, what the, and people are disoriented. Um, but what, what, it, what it is, is, uh, I mean, he, he, here's, here's where materialism is getting erected in, 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 in to the new God on another level, because the dogma is that God did not create the human race. We were created by the UFO aliens through genetic engineering. See, actually, intelligent design, that's, this is another thing. We, we, one of the most important things that, that, that any, any religious believer, believer of any religion needs to know about in our times is the intelligent design. Mm. And certainly, Wolfgang Smith is, is in, in his, you know, understands this and, and is and is in a certain sense part of it. But uh, William Dembski, for example, wrote a book called Intelligent Design, <laughs> where he's looking, you know, on the level of um, biology, he's saying the structures in the cell are impossible, you know, the complexity of of of, of uh, DNA is, is impossible to have happened by anything like chance. It had to have been designed. And he looks at it in statistically, according to um, information theory, and says this had to have been designed. Hmm. And and you know, and there's a Michael, as we I talked about these people last time, Michael, I guess Bear, Bear, so you pronounce his name, and he just looks at the, the little incredible machines that exist within a cell hmm. and how they're all art articulated. And how one of them couldn't have been created before the others. Right, right. It had to be a whole. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the others are necessary to its existence and they all work together. And, you know, and, and so this was, was a great uh, stroke against materialism. And one of the, the ways that, that scientism, the regime of scientism, which 
uh, you know, is, is enforced to a degree by the universities, uh, worked against the uh, intelligent design is to, is to falsely and very cynically connect intelligent design with those Christians who have uh, the uh, young earth creation theories, mm. who, who are truly cranks as far as I'm concerned, say, well, you know, according to uh, scripture or, you know, what could be adduced from scripture that the, the, the earth is 6,000 years old. And so, uh, you know, so, so what are the dinosaurs? Think? Well, some, some will say, well, God put the dinosaurs there, you know, the bones of the dinosaurs in the, in the strata of the earth to test our faith. To see if we would really believe in the Bible, or would we believe in in the in the secular science, or there there are things, you know, many things of that order of cranking, <laughs> which which really this is not helpful, you know. This, uh, I was very helpful. young when I read uh, the Monkey Trials. Oh yeah, that was a big that was a big one, you know. Um, William Jennings Bryan, you know, uh, yeah, and. Um, have you seen that movie, Inherit the Wind? No, I never saw the movie. Oh, yeah, that's the big movie of, about the, the, the uh, monkey trials. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, Tracy yeah. plays K Clarence Darrow. I forget who plays uh, William Jennings Bryan. And, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, and, of, of course, it, this is pro-science and, and, and anti-religion. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Poor, poor William Jennings Bryan loses, and, 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 and Spencer Tracy, Clarence Darrow, is sorry for him and says, well, he tried, you know, but, Unfortunately, what he said was not true. You know, so yeah, that that was that was really big. You know, what's interesting? I don't know. I don't know about apes, but th th there are traditional sources like the Mayan book, the Popol Vuh, that claim that apes are actually degenerate men. We didn't evolve from them; they devolved from us. And who knows to the degree. And I don't know how, how true these things are, but but you know, fringe archaeology is is finding evidence of of human races that existed, oh, you know, millions, many, many, many millions, actually hundreds of millions of years ago. I don't know if that's true, you know, but but what they say is, is very compelling, and and it, it it needs to be looked at. You know? Well, I'll share something with you and get your uh, feedback on that, since. You raised the question, so let's dive into that, and then we'll start off, inshallah, next week on, I guess, scientism is maybe a good place to start. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. uh, I yeah. want to show you this verse of the Quran and what some of the scholars have said about this. Uh, let me see if I can find it faster here. So this is one of the verses, okay? <clears throat> And then I'll try to explain it in how some of the Muslim scholars have tried to deal with this situation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. In Allah istafa Adam. Allah chose Adam. Now istafa, which means to choose, means that there had to be different choices. Mm -hmm. So one of the scholars, Dr. Israhim Rahmatullah, he said. That even though the Quranic emphasis is on the ruh, meaning what how the body evolved is from a Quranic perspective secondary. But if you look at the Quran, there, there are indications that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Adam, which means that there were some other beings that were human-like, you can say, mm -hmm. that were a choice, but Allah chose from other human-like beings a certain being to carry the ruh is 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 how one one way to interpret. I mean, who knows, right? Yeah. But that's how he he kind of looked at it, uh, based upon this verse and and several others. Um, Rumi also talks about that. You know, first Allah created the mineral world, and then the stones, and the plants, and the animals, yeah. and and, and pe people have used that that passage to say we see Rumi believed in evolution. You know, believed well, in it doesn't. It won't be Darwinian evolution, you know, it, it'll be maybe a type of evolution, but it won't be Darwinian evolution, no. I guess. Well, it's, 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 you know, there's an ontological, uh, you know, development that, 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 that is not simply all on the material level. You know, yes, I mean, yes. there, there, the, 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 you know, the presence of God may start <clears throat> in, in, in a, 
a pre-material level and come into a material level and, and come in, in, into different forms and then become angelic and then, you know, re re return, you know, to its point of origin. I mean, that this is not, whatever that may mean, that's not Dharma. You know? mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So uh, you were talking about the 6,000 years, uh, but I, and, and you were also talking about how the human degenerated to an ape. I think that's a very interesting point. No, I mean, it's, it's something to, to, to keep in the back of our minds, you know? Yes, I mean, yes. Um, because the Quran does say man was made into apes or a certain group of people were made into apes. And it maybe wasn't only Bani Israel. Maybe the Sunnah of Allah existed with several different nations. Uh, and so they were made into apes. Uh, and, and, you know, the, who were the, I mean, Ibn Arabi, uh, somewhere talks about you know in in a visionary state having um, a dialogue with uh, an earlier Adam, an Adam from a world age before our world age, an earlier mm -hmm. Adam, which is very interesting. And you have that this in Hinduism too. You have the idea of manvantaras, manvantaras, which are huge cycles of time. Each manvantara has a different manu who is the Adam for that cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's from the Sanskrit Manu or cognate with the Sanskrit Manu that we get our word for man. That's mm. what a man is. A man is an mm. Adam of a particular uh, a cycle or world age in, in, in the Hindu conception. And it's also interesting that uh, this the word man and the word Manu are, are related to the Sanskrit script word Manas, which means mind, which is related to the Latin word mens, which means mind, mm. which is rela also related to our word moon, because mm. mental knowledge is, is the reflection of, of spiritual truth, mm. right? Like the moon is a reflection of the light of the sun. So to the degree that, that to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is, is symbolically identified with the moon. That, That's that, that true. Yes. Yeah. He, he, he represents you know, the, the function of the human soul to reflect the, uh, you know, the spiritual truth of, of, of the roof. You know. mm. That's interesting. So, uh, this same uh, Manu, Mahanu, the Hindus, uh, some have said this is referring to Prophet Nuh because he came from the flood, right? And... Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's the same story of the flood repeated in Mahanu, uh, but that's interesting. Interesting. Well, uh, you know, it's uh, etymol etymology. In fact, what a lot of per per people would call spurious etymology or folk etymology, <laughs> where they say prove it. You know, that is, that is, that that's not where that word came from at all. You know, uh, <laughs> that's, that's one of one of my my loves is is uh, the, the Hindus have a science called Nirukta which is a kind of etymology that does not have to do with word derivations. Hmm. It has to do with word uh, forms, you know, the, the actual similarity of the word, for, word forms, which we basically look at almost as if it could be nothing but a pun, you know. Hmm. Uh, the similarity of the word forms uh, uh, from different languages or from different, you know, uh, words within Sanskrit or languages like that is, is not, uh, not accidental. Like for example, the word I, isn't it interesting that the word I means, you know, that through which we see, oh, interesting. You know, and it also means myself, you know, and, and, and what the, 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 the concept in, in Sufi anthropology that brings those two together is the concept of the eye of the heart. Mm. The eye of the heart, you know, is is the eye of God that, that sees the universe. You know, when we see with the eye of, of, of the heart, we're seeing the universe as God sees. It. Mm. And, and God, you know, according to uh, the Hebrews, his name is I am or I am that I am. Yes, so yes. I and I have an intrinsic Similarity, even though etymologically, in terms of time, word der derivations, they come from totally different directions. But here they intersect in 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 the in English in the word I, 
And that is, uh, according to the science of Nirukta, is very significant. So. Mm. Okay, inshallah, we will continue on scientism next week, if that's okay. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, what I have to say is I have to start selling books and making money. So everything I'm saying here, uh, most of it, well, we went in many different directions and we went in, into uh, my book, The Shadow of the Rose, about the, the romantic, the esoterism. Yes, the let me world. actually show that to everyone. Yeah, we can show, let me close this out so I can see what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. Shadow of the Rose, the Asotrism of the Romantic Tradition. We, you know, we took a side trip into this. And then the stuff that I'm saying about tafsir of the, natu of the natural world and the Quran's rela relationship, you know, or teaching about how we're to understand nature and the universe and also uh, how, how this reflects upon how science is to be conducted. Uh, you know, this is all going to be part of a new book I'm looking for a publisher for. Now I, now I have to, to uh, blow my own horn here and try and advertise. I'm looking for a publisher for a book which is coming together. All the parts are there. I just have to put them in the right order, called, which is going to be called uh, um, Islam, uh, Outer Form and Inner Truth. And uh, a bunch of the stuff that we're going to be talking about in terms of Quran and science, and also in terms of when we get to poetry, you know, so some of my transcreations of Rumi and such and such are all going to be in that book. And uh, I can I can publish it with my my old publisher because he will eventually publish everything I want. But I'm looking for larger publishers who can actually give me some marketing, you know, so I don't have to do it all myself. So if anybody is interested, this material, which you're hearing come out of my mouth is gonna be in one or more books and which are mostly written at this point. So if anybody's interested, you know, get back. Yeah, to so you. I also want to encourage everyone to, you know, if you know a publisher, that's great. Just send me an email or send uh, uh, Brother Charles an email. And more importantly is, uh, definitely start buying his books and start reading his books. Um, what are the, like the top three books you would tell people to start oh, off with? Well, I mean, I, it, it depends on what people are interested <laughs> yeah, in. Everybody, it's hard everybody to... says that my magnum opus is the system of antichrist. Okay, this one. Truth and okay. falsehood and postmodernism in the new age. Yes. You know, I got to say that. I mean, top three. And then you know, for, for what's going on. Yeah, how about those three? Let's, and, and, and you could say any number of, you, if, if you want to, to, to something about poetry, I really love what poets used to know. If you want something ab about the symbolism of old folk songs, Day and Night on the Sufi Path, Andrew Harvey, if anybody knows that name, uh, said that's the best book on Sufism he ever read. I, oh, you wow. know, and I've sort of, um, soft pedal that because uh you know i'm not a sheikh and everybody else who writes on sufism is a sheikh and so i'm never going to say i'm a sheikh but put it that way uh so, so but but yet you know I, I think that's a valuable book as well um and uh what the poets used to know yeah what poets used to know uh, folk metaphysics folk metaphysics is a little it's like like a whole. It's a whole story of, of of a culture or a civilization, sort of the esoteric underpinnings of of the West and 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 their resonances with with other traditions. But it's all talking about folk songs and 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 the, the secret meanings of folk songs. Uh, what you see there in, in, as the, in the picture that that that's a uh, one of William Blake's engravings. You can move oh. it a little to the side so it's not under your picture. Yeah, yeah. Th th there's, there's, uh, you know, the the the, the shepherd who, who's who's a big, uh, you know, symbol in in, in Western pastoral poetry. Pastoral mm. poetry means literally shepherd poetry, right? So there's oh. the shepherd, there's the sheep, and and he's carrying this little angel with wings, like a little child on his head. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the pictures of William Blake. So, so um, well, I mean, if if you want to look at the science of greater jihad, 
this is everything I said about uh, spiritual psychology. Besides, there's more of the same in uh, uh, Day and Night on the Sufi Path. Path, but if you're interested in spiritual psychology and its relationship to you know Western psychology and other things, it's all in there. I mean, some people have said that's the best book on that. <laughs> Mashallah. Yeah. The way and, forward for perennialism after the antinomianism of Fritz of Schumann is only for people involved in that world, probably. <laughs> but it's it's a, this is this is about uh, interfaith too, and how interfaith right. could work well and how it can go wrong, you know. So, yeah, this tales of Nazareth. That, that, that this uh, it, it is done a, a, along with uh, tales of Nasruddin. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, that, that's you know I, I did part I did the commentaries on this and some of the other commentaries are done by that Numatullahi uh, Dervish I mentioned who, who talked about Chris Kringle, so um, yeah and and so Sophia is you know I, I guess yeah and that, that's that's you know my epic poem there the wars of love uh, and, other and poems. some other oh, poems interesting wow mashallah mashallah. So, you know, I mean, take your pick. Take your pick. Everyone yeah. who can afford has to get one book, inshallah. Definitely get a taste of it. Um, and inshallah, people will, inshallah, buy. Uh, I'm pretty sure, inshallah. So um, next week, we'll pick up on scientism. Yeah, scientism. And one of the best writers on scientism and what the way out, out of scientism is Wolfgang Smith. I mean, he, he wrote his book, The Quantum Enigma, Finding the Hidden Key, is amazing. His book, uh, what's the last book, Jenny? Well, there's The Vertical Ascent, which I haven't read. There, there's one which ends with his refutation of Stephen Hawking. You know, okay. These are really good, really good books on, on uh, who, who takes Sayyid Hussein Nasr's call for the renewal of a, of a sacred science, you know, in, into the realm of, of reality and practicality. Okay, this is how you would do it. And he's one of the few people who, who is really a Western physicist and mathematician and rocket scientist, and at the same time has studied metaphysics. And, you know, uh, and, you know, he's, he's a gem. So, um, you know, he's, he's pretty old. So, you know, go to his website. He he's still doing little, you know, short videos and stuff. You know that that, that are very, uh, very interesting and, and very helpful. And and he's one of our major um, champions against scientism, but mm. from within science, not from the outside. From the outside, right, you can't right. do it. You have to accept everything that science has taught, and 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 has discovered, and and then say, but but these philosophical frameworks for this are just wrong. And he's done a, a wonderful job in that regard. So. Okay. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.